All right, and welcome back to Chapter 6, Section 3. We're calling this Day 2, uh, with a focus on the mean and the standard deviation of a binomial distribution. Well, if we go back a couple lessons and we look at finding the mean and the standard deviation of a binomial distribution, uh, we can simply use our calculator. Uh, and uh, again, with the, to find the mean, you just simply take uh, the individual x times its probability plus its individual x times its probability, etc., 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 until you get them all added up. Okay, um, so this uh, problem happens to deal with that f the five children and the probability of uh, having type O blood. Um, so this was the probability of having zero kids amongst five uh, have. Um, type O blood. This is the probability uh, of one out of the five having uh, type O blood. Now remember again, having one out of five uh, could be the first child, the second child, the third child, the fourth child, or the fifth child. So there's five different ways uh, of getting that and that's how they add up these different distributions or different probabilities to get that. Our distribution over the side here uh, does look a little skewed to the right. Um, so uh, again, if we're looking for the mean of this distribution, we know it'll be pulled a little bit more away from the center or the highest point here or that, from that median. So um, again, as I said, the probability distribution is skewed to the right. So in other words, it's more likely, it's more likely to have zero, one, or two children out of five uh, with type O blood. The center, uh, the median, uh, the median is simply one. Uh, and then for the mean, and we'd have to use that formula as I described. Standard deviation this is measured by the spread. Uh, again, you could calculate that variance using this you know, relatively complicated formula, or just tedious formula. I shouldn't say it's necessarily complicated. Um, but again, that would be taking uh, the individual probability minus the mean, so it would be minus 1.25, squaring it times its individual probability, and then do that for each of these and add them all up. To get the standard deviation, then, you'd have to square root that. Well, that's a lot of tedious work, and again, there's no restrictions to the calculator. So when we look at what we do on the calculator, again, I've already have this typed in, so the data was there. Uh, I can see from 0 to uh, 5 down here, these individual probabilities. And again, I just went to uh, the one variable statistics to calculate the mean, which is 1.25. And then our standard deviation down here was 0.968, as indicated on our screen. So you could do type this all in to the calculator, uh, you know, which is fine and dandy. It's all great, um, but there is a faster way with the binomial distribution. So uh, there has been some work uh, by prior mathematicians to come up with some shortcuts. So uh, a real fast way to find the mean is to simply take the n times the p. And uh, if we did that, uh, you could see in our previous problem, the n was uh, 5. So if we're looking for the mean of our x's, uh, there were five, uh, five children uh, times the probability of each is times point, the probability of having type O blood is 0.25. That was 1.25. The standard deviation of those of that x random variable again is the square root of the n times the p so 5 times the 0.25 times 0.75 and uh, when you do this this does come out to be that 0.968 as we got on the previous uh, screen so a lot faster uh, uh, just to remember these formulas, uh, they are on your formula sheet for you to use as well too. But again, these only work if it's a binomial distribution. Don't try to use these uh, if it's just a regular discrete distribution uh, or any other kind of distribution. The distribution has to be, it absolutely positively has to be a binomial distribution for us to use these formulas. Okay, so just a little shortcut. So what we can do is we can kind of look at an example of this and says Mr. Bullard's 21 AP statistics students did the activity on page 340. 
If we assume the students in his class cannot tell tap water from bottled water, then each has a one-third chance of correctly identifying the different type of water by guessing. So x equals the number of students who correctly identify the cup containing the different types of water. So that x can take on several variables. It could take any, on anywhere between 0 all the way up to 21 because it represents the number of students in this class out of 21 uh, that can identify uh, the cup containing the different type of water. Well, if, I, if I'm asked to find the mean and the standard deviation, well, I could go through and calculate all those probabilities uh, from for the random variable from 0 to 21, and that's a heck of a lot of work. So uh, the, we can utilize a shortcut, because if my n is 21, there's 21 students, and the probability of success of guessing uh, correctly the, uh, the cup containing the different types of water, we can use the formulas for mean and standard deviation. Mean is just simply n times p, or 21 times a third, so it's 7. So on average, uh, it should have seven students that are able to guess uh, what kind of water is in the cup. And then the standard deviation, 21 times one-third times two-thirds, and then square rooting that is 2.16. So if the activity were repeated many times with groups of 21 students who were just guessing, the number of correct identifications differ from seven by, on average, about 2.16. So you can see it saves a lot of time knowing these, these two different formulas for mean and for standard deviation of a binomial distribution. So uh, they are important in statistics. We wish to make inferences about the proportion of success in a population. Almost all real-world sampling, such as taking an SRS from a population of interest, is done without replacement. And that should cause some... Uh, some concern because if we sample without replacement that means the probability changes from one to the next and that's a violation of the independence condition in our BINS uh, acronym uh, for establishing a binomial distribution but when the population is much larger than the sample the count of successes in an SRS of size n is approximately the binomial distribution uh, with n equal to the sample size and p equal to the proportion of successes in the population. So in other words, what they're kind of getting at, what they're saying here, is that if your population is really large, and if you're doing this without replacement, you know, let's just simply look at a problem like if I was, uh, if I had 25 successes out of, uh, say, a million. Now if I did it with replacement, it'd be uh, the next one would be 25 out of a million uh, for two consecutive events. But without replacement, it's like 25 out of a million. And then if I did it without replacement, I'd have 24 left out of 999,999. And what they're basically saying is that uh, this second probability, when, you're, when your population is large enough, this fraction, this decimal, is so... Infinitest infinit infinite, infinitely small that the difference between these two is really negligible. Um, so you can still continue to use the binomial distribution even though yes, practically the, the probability has changed. It's not the same one from, uh, from one, uh, one choice to the next, uh, but it is so small that uh, we can use the binomial. Um, so what we want to do is we want to make sure that when taking an SRS of size n from a population of size capital N, we can use a binomial distribution to model the count of success in this sample as long as this is satisfied. In other words, as long as our sample size is less than or equal to a tenth of the population. I actually prefer to uh, do a little algebra on this and multiply both sides by 10 and say if 10 times the sample size is less than or equal to the population, the binomial is okay. Okay to use. Okay. All right. So as n gets larger, something interesting happens to the shape of a binomial distribution. Uh, our figure below will kind of illustrate this. So I start off. I've got a sample size of 10, and the probability of uh, is, of success is 0.8. 
Uh, we've kind of got a distribution here that looks maybe a slightly bit skewed uh, to the left, but as we increase our sample size, as we increase our sample size from that population, from 20 to 50, we really start to see that that distribution starts to become normal. So, um, if X has a binomial distribution with N trials, then the success would probably be a P. When our sample size is large, when N is large, the distribution of the random variable is approximately normal with mean and standard deviation, these two formulas that we talked about earlier. So what we can do is if the sample size gets really, really large, what we can do is we can use the normal, approx normal distribution to approximate the distribution. But with our calculators, we shouldn't have a problem doing binomial distributions. Uh, by hand, we'd have a heck of a time. But with a calculator, uh, we shouldn't have to use the normal approximation. But as a rule of thumb, we'll use that normal approximation when n is very large. Uh, so in other words, we won't use it unless the n times p is greater than or equal to 10 and, and, has to be both, has to be both, and the n times the probability of failure, the 1 minus p, is also greater than or equal to 10. So, um, so in other words, that both the expected number of successes and failures are both at least 10. All right, so there's ending day two uh, of section 6.3. And what that should do is give you the skills and the ability to go and work on the second half uh, or day two of 6.3, problems number 79, 81, 83, 85, 87, and 89. And be able to calculate the mean and standard deviation of a binomial random variable. All right, good luck, and we'll see you for the last lesson in 6.3 in the next video.